Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this morning for our work and our presentation here on Give Me the Bible. Uh, it's always great to be able to come into your home, and we know that we have people that are avid listeners uh, and who watch this telecast each week, and we appreciate it very, very much. Uh, it's always great to hear your comments. Many of you have uh, given calls to give me the Bible. You have sent emails, and we just continue to receive so many of them. We appreciate it, and we hope today will be no exception. We hope that you're tuned in. I hope you have your Bible this morning because we're going to be running some scriptural references here as we talk about the subject of worship. You know, God has wired us to want to worship something. That's why there's so many different little g gods in the world today. People want to bow down, but you know what? The scripture says there's only one God, and that's the one that we really want to worship. And uh, we're going to call upon uh, my good friend from over uh, at College Station today and Brian for the Rocky Whiteley to tell us a little bit about this God, worshiping the right God, Rocky. Thank you, Dan. It's so good to be with all of you today. And yes, as we start talking about the right God, the passage we want to turn to is John chapter 4. As we see Jesus meeting a woman at a well in a town of Samaria. And of course, Jesus met all kinds of people. But when we look here at John chapter 4, he has an interesting conversation with her, says some things about her life that he shouldn't have known if he was just a regular person. But because he's the Son of God, he knew these things about her. And she responds to him and says, Sir, I perceive in verse 19 that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, and you say we must worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus replied in verse 21, Woman, believe me, there is a time coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now I want you to think about what Jesus said there for just a moment what they didn't know, because the Samaritans were basically a mixed people of Israelites and others from around the Assyrian world that were brought in. Well, when they came in, they brought their pagan gods with them, and so they have a mixture of the true God and these pagan gods, and that's why Jesus says, you worship what you don't know, we worship what we do know, and Jesus continues on, Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the ones, the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. We look at this and we say, we must have the right God. They thought that they could mix their worship by worshiping the true God and worshiping these pagan gods, Jesus says, no, only God, only God, and we worship him in spirit and in truth because he is the one and true God. Dan? Rocky, thank you. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you said what you said this morning because there is only one God. And Father, above all, in all, and through all. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we preach about right here on Give Me the Bible. He is the only true and living God. Well, when we talk about worshiping that God, and we obviously have to know how to worship Him, and you know, God gives us specific instructions with that regard. 
And we're going to call her Brother Mary Haynes right now to tell us how do we worship God in the right way? Or is there really a wrong way to worship God, Mary? Notice in that text how Jesus repeats the repeats the phrase that God is spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As I heard one person say, it's that's the right way and the right way. In other words, the right way in truth, there is a factual truth of how to worship. The plan that God says to worship. If you're going to give him, uh, if you're going to give him worship, then you must do it in a way that he is authorized and is pleasing to him. But it also means in the right way, in the sense, in the right spirit the right meaning. You know, you might tell your young child, you know, apologize to your sister. And you, they would look at him and say, I'm sorry. And they've said the words correctly, but there's no meaning behind it. There's no uh, care in there. There's no enthusiasm in that. And that is in essence how we must worship. We must worship the right way with the right spirit, with the right feeling. You know, I use the word enthusiasm. That's a word that actually comes from the Greek language. And the prefix there, you, you might notice the theo in there is like theology. It means God. But the, the first prefix there means inside. In, in essence, enthusiasm means God, literally means God inside. In other words, it's this idea that the Spirit of God that, that would cause us to have a, an enthusiastic response. We care more. We, we put more into it because of what it means to us. I recently read about uh, when you go to work for the Oklahoma City Thunder, the organization, the basketball organization in Oklahoma City, the general manager, Sam Presti, will take whoever it is and he will take them to the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial. And if you've ever been there, it's a very powerful thing. There are a certain amount of chairs that set out there, 168, that represent the victims of that great tragedy. And you can't help but walk in there and feel uh, the, the sense of what the tragedy did to that area. And at the end of that, he will talk to those players, to those workers, and say, you are representing these people. The people in the stands the night of the game are people that have been affected by this, and you are helping to encourage and bring them forth. And it reminds them what they're there for. Who are you playing for? In essence, when we walk before God in worship, we are, rep we are showing God what he means to us. The psalmist said in Psalms 140, 104, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless him. When we come into worship, we should look and say, this is the God that created us. This is the God that sustains us. How can we give him due homage? What can we do that is pleasing him? What have we, he, he told us that we may worship him? And how can we do it in a way that shows it's truly meaningful to us? That we understand the great sacrifice that was made for us and all that he did through, for us through the giving of his son and, and how he cares and loves for us today. We must approach him with thankfulness because he is a God that deserves worship in the right way and in the right spirit. And anything less than that, my friend, would not be acceptable unto God. David said, This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. You know, there's a song that we sing sometimes entitled, Oh, Worship the King. That's the one that we worship. Uh, the church is not a democracy. It is a monarchy. Actually, when we think about it, Christ is the monarch, and we are here to bow before him and worship him the only true and living God, to worship him. Now, Brother Jerry Munholland uh, is here this morning also. And uh, Jerry, tell us further about this thing of worship. And I, I know that the word worship actually means to kiss toward, to offer to. And so, but tell us a little bit more about this thing of worship. Well, thank you, Dan. When we read in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit and they that worship him, worship him, remember that, must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I want to go to Psalm 100. As we, it is that we kiss toward, remember that who our worship is for. In Psalm 100, it says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And so it is as we kiss toward or as we look for the one who has given us life. He's given us purpose here and, and so we just, it flows through us to worship him. He is above us all. 
And so we come into his presence. That's what the worship is for, not for anyone else. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives three condemnations about worship activities. When it was that he said that you give and you, whenever you give, don't sound the trumpet in giving. You're giving toward men and not toward God. For you have your reward of men if you're giving toward men or for they to be seen of men. He also said, whenever you pray, uh, don't stand on the street corners and give loud utterances. It is all oh, the men hear you because that's all you're interested in. You're not toward God in this. And the same way with fasting, don't disfigure your face. He said, you, you, you're doing it for show, show of others. You're not doing it before God. And so we can worship and be condemned in our worship to be seen of men and not of God. I want to read in the book of Hebrews about uh, our worship, the offering up the sacrifice of praise. We read in Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Who is it that we come before his presence with singing? It's our God Almighty, the Holy One, our Creator. And we offer him the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. Watch what we say, particularly in the worship. Not only our attitude, but what we do continually the fruit of our lips. Don't let anyone substitute worship for you. You participate in that singing. You participate in that sacrifice. You participate in honoring God with worship. Now back to you, Dan. Brother Jerry, I appreciate your good words. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you said what you did there at the last also because no one can really worship for you. You know, a lot of churches have what they call praise teams and you know, I've always been led to believe that the church is the praise team. Uh, we are to be praising God and honoring Him, all of us, collectively. Isn't that the way they did it in New Testament times? Well, no one can pray for you, and no one can sing for you, no one can read the Bible for you, no one can be saved for you. We all have to follow that pattern that God has given. Well, but there's Joe Hancock. Uh, I, I want to come to you now because uh, I know that you get excited about this thing of worship. And uh, shouldn't we be excited when we enter into the house of God? A lot of people, and probably some of you are sitting out there this morning, and you're saying in your mind, well, we're going to have to hurry up and get ready to go to worship. Like it's a dread, like it's not something you want to do. But shouldn't we be excited, Joe? Dan, I believe you're, you're exactly right. We ought to be excited. What's not to be excited about is the question I would ask. Why, why wouldn't you be excited to be able to go in the presence of Almighty God who created us, who created the universe with his voice, let there be this, let there be that, and it appeared and it was. That's the God we serve when we go to worship service on Sunday and Sunday evening and Wednesday evening Bible class, Sunday morning Bible class. Uh, you know, going to Bible class is not just going to Bible class. That's, that's, a, that's a form of worship, studying God's Word to draw ourselves closer to Him because we want to be more like Him. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm surprised, Dan, that people, you know, some people think their, their worship service is boring. Well, it would be my opinion, and this is, anytime I use the word opinion, I always declare that it's my opinion. It's my opinion that these people's image of God is boring. If, if they think God is boring, they don't have a clue to, or that they think worship is boring, they don't have a clue of the God that they're worshiping when they do go to worship. Uh, th this is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of majesty, a God of righteousness, a God of envy, yes, because he loves us so much, he is envious of, about us. So Dan, you know, this, this thing about, you know, the main, the main theme, if you could draw a main theme of the Old Testament, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, one God. And we talked about the last show, one God in three persons, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
But then you also have one main theme running through the New Testament. It's recorded in Philippians 2, verse 11. Uh, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, Jesus runs through the, the entire Bible. Uh, for someone to say that worship service is boring, they don't understand how important Jesus is to the topic thread of the scriptures. Uh, it, it's all about Jesus. God is one? Absolutely. Jesus is the, is the Savior? Absolutely. And how can we even consider being bored or think it's a lackadaisical thing to do or just something that we have to go do? How can we even think that when Jesus willingly let himself be nailed to a cross, beaten, chastised, spat on, crown of thorns slammed down on his head, robes taken off of him, nailed to that cross, posted up there for all the world to see, and died right there on that Roman cross. He did that for you. How can worship to the Father who allowed him to do that come anywhere close to being bored or boring? Dan, I have issue with that, and I hope that uh, this message has encouraged some to take a different look at worship when they worship God. Well, Joe, sometimes we need to back up and take another look at worship. And uh, I'm glad and thankful that today is the day that the Lord's made and we can worship Him. And I hope that you'll not use this program as simply as uh, a time of worship, but that you'll get up and go into the house of God. And, uh, you know, you may be a little unclear with uh, a lot of things in your mind. There's a man by the name of Asaph we read about in the Old Testament. And, you know, the Bible says Asaph made the statement, there were so many things I didn't understand until I went into the sanctuary of Almighty God. You know, there are things that really come into great clarity when we meet and worship God collectively. But... Brother uh, Bivens, uh, James, you know, D Joe said something about the fact that, uh, you know, we need to be excited about entering into the house of God, but how do we get excited? How do we energize ourselves? Is it something that you do, or how does that happen? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brother Dan. That's a good question, Dan. We should be energized about going to worship service. Just think, we're going to be in the presence of the creator of the universe. You know, most of the time when people say to me they don't get much out of worship service, I have a couple of thoughts that come to mind. First, I think that we should be giving praise and honor to God. And second, that's why they feel the way they do is they're not worshiping for the right reason. Worship involves three things, a shouting, energy, enthusiasm. Did you hear how loud those people cheered at the Super Bowl recently? My thought was, a hundred years from now, what's going to matter? Who won that game or my relationship with Jesus the Christ? And what about your relationship with Jesus the Christ? We should be serving God with gladness, singing with joyful from our hearts to God. As one reads through the book of Revelation, chapters 4 through 8, we can find out several things about worship. We see the holiness and greatness of God the content of the praises, specifically the gospel in which Christ redeems people from every nation through his blood, the benefits that believers have in Christ, the diversity of worshipers who will be in heaven, the justice of God. Let's take a quick peek. If you have your Bibles, look at Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 8. It says, And the four beasts each had six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and was and is to come. And those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne that liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him and sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Is that how you approach worship? Revelation 5, 9 says, And they sang a new song. Revelation 7, starting in verse 9, says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, all kindreds, all people, all tongues, stood before the throne and the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb. 
All the angels stood around the throne about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and they worshiped God. They said, Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Psalm 101 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Psalm 95 one says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. What people see when you worship is important, but what's even more important is what God sees. Thank you for uh, helping us to understand that we ought to be energized when we go into the house of God. I mean, that's something to really be energized about, isn't it? People didn't come to worship God in New Testament times when lackadaisical ways, but they came and they worshiped God honorably, but they worshiped him according to his will in the right way and the right spirit as well. You know, in the Old Testament, God's prophet said, the singers sang aloud. You know, sometimes people come to worship and they just mumble words and they don't really sing out. But I'm going to ask Brother Chris Grota right now, why should they sing out? Chris, and, and isn't there going to be singing in heaven? Well, I believe that's absolutely right, Dan. The Bible does say that, that we're going to be worshiping God. It'll be like one eternal day. It's, it's all that we can do to, to get our minds I wrapped around those words and those descriptions that we have of heaven. Uh, but in this life, uh, James 5 and verse number 13 is the question, is anybody happy? Are you merry? Well, let them sing psalms. Let's sing hymns. Our hymns are praises to God. Yeah, David in the Old Testament, he was a hymn writer there in the book of Psalms. So many of his hymns are written there no less than 17 times, maybe more. Uh, does he have the phrase, I will sing to the Lord? I will sing, I will sing and give praise. And then in Psalm 57, 9, I will sing to you among the nations, which means you're going to take those songs that we normally sing by ourselves with our families or even just in the church assembly, and you're going to take it out public, and you're going to use that as a teaching tool. I think that's wonderful. Think about the great uh, people in the Bible who sang. Uh, Jesus and his disciples saying, Paul and Silas, can you imagine reading Acts chapter 16 and there be no reference to, to Paul and Silas singing at midnight in the, in the innermost parts of the prison and all the people, all the prisoners that were jailed there heard them. Imagine the wonderful teaching that was being accomplished and the faith that, that people saw in Paul and Silas considering their situation, and yet they were able to sing praises and pray prayers unto God. What an amazing thing. And so we get into the church assembly, and Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 are parallel passages, and the Bible says that we're to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We're to sing with grace, with gratitude in our heart to the Lord, Colossians 3.16. I know that there are some people who are very conscientious about their voice. There are people that are, disc, uh, that are not comfortable. Maybe there's a little bit of pride. Maybe there's some macho men out there that just don't want to sing in public. Well, that's, that's not Christian. The Christian thing to do is to sing because God is worthy of our praise and out of the overflow and the abundance of gratitude and praise that comes from our heart, we, we give it up to God in song. God has commanded singing because he loves that. That's what he wants from us. And that's what we shall give him. And I say that the Bible says everybody should sing. Well, thank you, Chris. And I really believe that we should. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, worship services tend to be a little boring, maybe because people are not really getting into it. I've always been led to believe that it would be easier to maybe cool down a fanatic a little bit than it would be to heat up a corpse. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes you go into the house of worship and uh, worship starts at 11 o'clock sharp and ends at 12 o'clock dull. It shouldn't be that way. But we should be a people that come together for one purpose, and that is to honor our God. Now, some people say, well, you know, I honor God on my couch, or I can honor God out in the boat on a lake somewhere. I can honor God on the golf course. But can you do it with the saints of God? 
And that's what, you know, there was a time for individual worship, but there is also a time for collective worship when the church came together. And that to me is so very, very important. And absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. Absent makes a heart wonder. And people wander away from God. You just mark my word, I've seen it happen. People draw away from God based upon their lack of attendance in worship. So let me encourage you to get up this morning, go to the house of God, and worship the Lord. I'm Dan Manuel, and I've been privileged this morning to be your host right here on this program. And we hope you'll join us next week, all of these panelists, in our discussion of the Word of God right here on Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.